I'm Azala here again for the Small Business Digest. You know, what's getting towards the end of the year, people start thinking of two things, wrapping up this year and how do you grow next year? Well, we've decided, uh, and we were lucky enough to get two people that want to talk about growth, which is nice in this world today. Uh, uh, Michael Frino I'm a, and Katie yep. Desiderio are here to talk about it. And But as we always ask, we're first going to ask them about their personal background, then about what they do, and finally a website where you can learn about what I think is a very, very interesting book. So it's all yours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll go first. Yeah, so uh, my name is Katie Desiderio. I am a faculty member at Moravian University. Um, I've been working at Moravian since 2009. Uh, in addition to my work at Moravian, I own a consulting company called Proximal Development. Um, I share that because the word proximal will come up for us in a little while as we talk about the work that we do. Um, and Mike and I actually met in our doctoral program over a decade ago. And we've been doing research in the traditional academic space, um, you know, for over 10 years. And it wasn't until recently that, you know, in my work at the university, I was going up for full professor. And we started to explore an element that was included in that, uh, that career trajectory, which is writing a book. And so Mike and I decided to move out of our comfort zones in the traditional, you know, research space and look at really writing a book. And so I'll, I'll have Mike introduce himself. Yeah, Michael Frino. I work um, in organizational development for a Fortune 500 company. As Katie mentioned, you know, have a passion for, you know, research and development. And that's what kind of took us on the journey to, to, to write a book. So excited to be here. Thank you. So what's the name of your book? The book is called The Beekeeper pollinating your organization for transformative growth. And so I love that you opened, right? That we're here to talk about growth. That's one thing that, you know, Mike in industry and, and myself in higher education, there's alignment in the purpose of the work that we do. And that's about fueling growth, both for ourselves and for the people that we work with and through. And so as we think about leadership and really the book is a leadership fable, it encourages the opportunity for number one, for us to lead from every seat. But it also helps us to think about how we're creating organizations that are helping people grow, right? And so we really have to create the environment to encourage that optimization of what people can do um, in the spirit of ongoing learning and growth. A website? People can learn more? Yeah, so we have a website called Leadership Fables. Um, and, and part of uh, what we're trying to accomplish is you know, write a number of short stories. Storytelling becomes very important in, in business. And, um, you know, this is one of many, hopefully, but um, people can go to leadershipfables.com and, uh, you know, access a number of resources, learn about the book, um, learn about, you know, how they can pollinate their organization, you know, personally. Um, yeah, so we're excited. Leadershipfables.com. Can you spell it out for our audience? Sure. All right. Leadership, L-E-A-D-E-R-S-H-I-P. Fables, F A B L E S. Dot com. You, you, you may laugh about it, but some of the uh, of our stream is uh, radio, so it's always better to put it on there. Do you have a copy oh, of the book with you? Do you have a copy of the yeah, book of there? Yeah. Of course we do. Oh, don't say that. Many so people here's don't. Uh, okay. Here's our book. All right. Yep. And so um, Mike and I were really humbled. Um, the book came out in May earlier this year. And um, we learned a week after launch that it hit Wall Street Journal bestseller. It was number five on the Wall Street Journal um, in business list. And so we are in a space now of really learning how we uh, market the book, right? How we continue to keep our book sales high. And then as Mike said, you know, as we're working on future work that we're learning, you know, from this experience and how we kind of thread ongoing work. Okay, now we've sat there, and we've talked a little bit about the book, but uh, I'm a small business owner, which is what our, our show is all about. What are some of the things in your book 
that you can be t telling that, uh, telling me uh, as someone who's leading a company right now and is scared to death about what's going to happen in the next year? Oh yeah, so so really well said. I think that's the impetus for the for the book, right? I think there's a lot of uh, individuals who, you know, you know, start a company, you know, it, it starts growing, it starts us with a small business, and hopefully, you know, sees a lot of success. But you know, one of the fundamental you know messages in the book is that you know don't lose sight of kind of you know what got you started, your mission, your values. Sometimes people forget what why they got into business, and as your company grows. Um, you know, you can put more focus on performance and people, and, and that becomes a real issue culturally. So the book really helps, uh, you know, organizations and small businesses establish that they can't lose sight of culture as they grow. Um, you know, and, 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 and even though, you know, the, there's uncertainty in the economy, you know, that's just not felt by the small business owners. Certainly that's felt by the, um, you know, the people in the company, you know, what should they do? The employees, uh, they have those same fears. So it's really up to the leader, uh, the owner of the small business to, uh, you know, think through how do they, uh, you know, you know, make sure that those employees feel like they're connected to the culture and that they're feeling supported. And um, and then that's really what people can kind of see some of those messages resonate uh, throughout the beekeeper. And, you know, Don, I want to echo something that Mike just said. Um, as a small business owner, you know, he talked about growth. And, you know, as organizations grow, it is easy to get in habits, right, of the way that we've always done it. And so there's an undertone in the book of not only learning, but unlearning. And unlearning is much harder for adults than learning is because we're habitual creatures, right? And so in yeah. the spirit of unlearning, right, how are we really thinking about the why, right? What our purpose is, how we're aligning people to our mission, but then unlearning things that just don't work anymore. We can't continue to escalate commitment to things because it's the way that we've always done it. We really have to think innovatively in ways that help us right in that way forward and we're also creating a climate where we're inviting our employees to do that with us which helps encourage agility especially through change well let me ask you a question uh, we talk a lot about values company values okay but if i as a if i want to buy a product do i really care whether the, the company has values or not um uh, you know, what I want is a product that will work. So I, you're talking about as the, as as the consumer, Don. You're talking about as a consumer. Do you care what the values are as the or, consumer, or B two B, et cetera, especially B two B? Yeah, know, it's a question that's kind of came up quite recently with another interviewer who who, who talked about the importance of of a company having values. But is it really that yeah. they have value or that they have the ability to deliver a first rate product? Yeah, I think I think that's an interesting concept and I can see why it recently came up on a podcast. You know, I think uh, the employees of your company should have, you know, buy into the company's values, because when you have an employee who is bought into what the company stands for, then they're going to work harder, build a better product, you know. Um, make sure that they're, you know, achieving performance goals. And and so that's kind of why a company needs values. You may not care about it as a consumer um, of, of buying the product, and that may not be important to you, but the people making that product, the people delivering the the product to the marketplace, you know, working in, in you know, behind the scenes to, to produce that output, they're the ones who do care if the company has values and if they're aligned values and if they can find meaning in their work. And so it's... Um, you know, it really is important that those companies have a, not only a, a value system, but then they ensure that the employees are aligned to those values, in my opinion. Okay. Well, uh, uh, before we go further, your book again and how people can get it? Yeah, the book is called The Beekeeper, Pollinating Your Organization for Transformative Growth. And they can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any any online retailer. Um, they can also go to our website at leadershipfables.com um, you know, and, and get the book as well. Okay. Well, having said that, what what are um, can you give us an example of some of the things that you think are critically important to success for the leader for a leader a leader's success? Yes. Yeah, so I think it goes back to what we opened with in the undertones of ongoing learning and growth. 
And so when we think about, you know, the spirit of learning and unlearning, it's easy for us to enact fixed mindset. And so I don't know how familiar you are with Carol Dweck's work, but there's an undertone of the seminal work there that we have to be able to embrace growth mindset, which means we're always learning. So as leaders, we don't have all the answers. Just because we've done it for X number of years, it doesn't mean that we know more than the people around us. It might mean that we can help guide or shepherd, but if we show up with beginner's mind and the opportunity for us to unlearn we're demonstrating right an opportunity for the people in our organizations to do that too and so for leaders sometimes it's about getting out of our own way right mm -hmm. to think about how we can encourage the way forward and then help bring people along and to mike's point earlier you know aligning on values right not only saying these are our values but that we see those values enacted in our behaviors in the decision making right in the way that we're encouraging right, uh, our products and interactions with our customers, all of those things help us build credibility over time. Well, okay. Um, but can a leader admit that he or she doesn't know something? Of course. Yeah, sure. Well, Absolutely. Well, you say, of course, but the, does the leader need to somehow maintain a reason for being a leader? What what makes him or her a leader besides the fact that they found the company or put in a role? How do they demonstrate leadership? Well, I think, Don, you know, there's an important discernment of the difference between a manager and a leader. And so leaders can lead from any seat. You don't necessarily have to have a team to be a leader, right? Because leadership is about influence. And so we hope that people who have teams, right, are enacting effective leadership styles, right, and practices. But from a leadership perspective, it's about moving people forward, right? And so in that opportunity, right, we have to be able to show that we're demonstrating moving ourselves forward as leaders as well. And that doesn't mean that we have all the answers. It doesn't mean that we're not showing up every day learning, but that's where growth mindset comes in, right? We get to choose who and how we want to be. And there's an undertone there in the book that every chapter name is a be mindset. And so as leaders, we have this opportunity to have agency over how we're authoring our leadership story. And I think oftentimes people fail to give themselves the permission to hold the pen to author their story that might look different, right? In the way that Mike might author his story or the way I might author mine. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's a little bit of um, even unlearning what leadership is and the opportunity for people really to lead from every seat. Yeah, and, and I'll just comment. I think one of the words is well, well said, Katie. And I think one of the things that resonates with me with talking about a book, but even small businesses, like some people, you know, work from their home, right? Some people work in a, a small office. They're a small business. They don't have a, a fancy building. And, and the, the old age old saying that you can't judge a book by its cover, like, I fundamentally disagree with you, you. You pretty much can judge a book by its cover and say like, hey, like what's going on? Whatever's on the surface, you need to like show up in a meaningful way and be curious to kind of explore like, okay, what is behind this cover? What's in the pages? What's in the, in the company? Because some people can make uh, judgments, you know, just by looking at something and saying, you know, what is this, you know, and why would I do business with this person? Or why should I work with this business? Um, and in and, and the product or what's behind that that building or that cover, uh, you know, hopefully, um, really hopefully is something beautiful and and you're not judging the book by what you see on the surface. Are you able to, are you able to hear me out? Okay. okay. Right, we, so yeah, so to answer that question, I think, you know, not many leaders knew. Well, well let, me, let me put the question to you, which uh, came across my desk yesterday and it's still unpublished study that indicates that confidence in leadership has gone down uh, in this study 11% overall and mm. in, in feeling confident in their leader, in the company's leadership or the ability to survive. Uh, have, you, have you any thoughts on this subject? And uh, part of it was the fact that they were out of, out of the office rather than in the office. But it was more to do with the, how companies were managing uh, the, the current environment. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's important that we, we recognize that many leaders didn't know how to handle these this difficult situation. So everybody was kind of learning together. And so, you know, employees probably were looking to leadership for some kind of guidance, some kind of advice on how to handle it. And, you know, 
I think people were learning. So there has to be an element of employees giving organizations grace, understanding that this was a new environment for everybody and that, you know, most people are doing, you know, doing, doing the best they can, but you're right. If the, if the leadership team and the, the organization wasn't delivering kind of the value that, that they set out during this time, or they were departing from their values that they potentially um, set forth, um, you know, early on that the small business could fail and, and, uh, um, or not do well or go down or product productivity could go down or even the feeling of meaningful work could go down. I don't have the, um, you know, I haven't read that study that you mentioned, but I look forward to it. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of factors. I think people look to leadership for guidance and when leadership doesn't have answers that you could, you could lose some trust there for sure. And I'll add to that, you know, a, a close colleague, um, you know, authored some of the work on the great attrition or the great attraction, you know, through McKinsey's work on how we retain talent post pandemic. And interestingly, a lot of the results aligned with what we went, what went back to earlier and Mike mentioning the importance of values, right? So people wanted alignment of purpose. They wanted to feel supported from their leadership. And they also wanted to know that their contributions mattered. And so in the spirit of being in a virtual space, right, it challenged the opportunity of how we were communicating that. Because again, we had to learn new ways to find connection. We had to learn new ways, right, to, for people to feel that the work that they were doing was meaningful. And so, you know, organizations are in this space now of really testing their agility to be able to respond to thinking about how we're creating meaningful connection to help people rise. Yeah, well, said. Well, if, you, if you had to, uh, what are one or two things you'd like the people to come away from your book with? with? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, one of the key concepts is the art of being proximal and proximal means placing yourself at the center of, you know, your heart, like closest to the heart. That's what it means by definition. So, you know, we think as small business owners, you guys, you know, should all play an active role. And it's important that organizations play an active role in the the, the development of maturation of employees and, and helping them grow. And if, if you're not coming at things from a development lens and only performance focus, then, you know, you could lose sight of the human being. And and, and, and that's what that's where I think uh, culture breaks down and performance breaks down. So the art of learning to be proximal means, you know, small businesses should you know ask themselves, you know, are they placing themselves at the center of growth for their their people, um, you know, not only personally, but professionally. And so that's one of the core tenets. And I don't know if you want to talk about any other ones. Very well said. Mm, awesome. uh, we have a few minutes left. What would you like to leave our audience? <laughs> Excuse me. What would you like to leave our audience with? You know, I think we're grateful for the opportunity. We're looking forward to, you know, um, you know, we hope everybody, you know, picks up, you know, certainly the book. You know, it's it was a Wall Street Journal bestseller. You know, our call to action for the audience is that, you know, if you're looking for ways to, you know, think about engaging your employees differently. Um, you know, you know, get the beekeeper, right? Get it for your teams. Um, our, our, our website has plenty of guides and growth guides that you can use to help put your team on a development journey. Um, you know, I, I ask everybody on the call who's listening to this on the radio or reading it, you know, when was the last time you had a conversation not about performance metrics and, and more about the human being and, and growing your employees personally and professionally? And if the answer has been a while, then, then uh, here's a really easy way to kind of do something for them that can help put them on a path to, to personal growth and development. And, and I think organizations and companies will see a, uh, a remarkable increase in engagement and productivity and performance when they focus less on just how are we delivering this product and more about the people who are making and delivering the product. So that's our call to action. Well, one more time, your book and how people can get it. Go ahead, put it up there. <laughs> yeah, it's called Beekeeper Pollinating an Organization for Transformative Growth. How did you come up with the title? I mean, ironically, I mean, Katie and I were, uh, you know, on business together. You know, I we met up for pizza and, um, you know, we just started, uh, you know, brainstorming and we were talking about pollinating and growing organizations. And when we talked about the word pollination, it made us think of the bee and really what the bee does, right? And the bee is responsible for growth of all things around us. So we as researchers went on a journey to learn from beekeepers, how they create thriving hives, uh, how they think about each of the workers and each of the bees in the hive and their roles and responsibilities and how they're all maybe doing something a little different, but, but certainly, um, you know, have a, a productivity mindset. 
And we'll add to, you know, you can see in the book that the second E in beekeeper is dotted. Yeah. And so we ask, that, right, that second E falls at the end of the story because we ask leaders to become beekeepers, B-E. You get to choose who and how you want to be as a leader. And we can encourage our people, right, to have the volition to choose who and how they want to be as well. And when we do that, right, we're activating agency in how we show up and how we're encouraging ongoing learning and growth, not only for ourselves, but for the people around us. Well, how do you write the book? Do you write alternating chapters? Do you write a chapter and then go over it? How, how, do, how do two people collaborate on a book? I'll say yes, but exactly. <laughs> so so um, that's, this is exactly right. We would, we would have chapters that, you know, either one of us would say like, I'm going to start working on this or, you know, I'm going to work on it. You look at it, add to it. Like I said, Mike and I have been researching together and writing papers for over a decade. So the collaboration was learned over time um, and now is kind of just a really easy, seamless, right? Grounded in trust process. Um, we align on the vision. We align on the leadership learnings and the undertone that we want threaded throughout the story. And then we kind of divide and conquer as we go through, you know, reaching our, our writing goals. Are you gonna write another one? Yep. We're yeah, already we're, we're working, working on book it. two. Uh -huh. um, well, on that note, we say thank you for, uh, to me, a very illuminating uh, time together. Thank you for thank joining you. us. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Don. Don Mazzella here. I just want to tell you about my newest book, uh, Ruler of the Seas. It's the first a volume in a, a trilogy about a, a real life American, uh, unsung American hero. I'd like you to uh, hopefully to, uh, learn more about it at Barnes and Noble and Amazon. Uh, I took five years of research and two years of writing, and you might like it. Uh, it's um, every event in the book actually happened. Most of the characters in it are true based on real people, real events. So if you get a chance, take, take a look, Ruler of the Seas.